Welcome back. I'm Molly McConnell from Cultivate Balance, and we will be getting into a lecture about Ayurvedic daily routine and self-care. So a lecture means that we're going to be here together for about an hour, going in depth on these concepts. So make sure that you have the time and the space to commit the next hour to being really present with me to learn a little bit more about how you can start building the foundation to support your work-life balance through daily routine and self-care. Some of these concepts might seem simple, they might be really familiar, and that's okay. They might feel totally new to you, and that's okay too. We're all in this together to build, as I mentioned, the foundation. Building the foundation means starting small and simple and slow and sustainable so that you can ultimately establish more strength and endurance, more accountability and more energy to bring in other more complex practices that will also serve your work-life balance, your energy, your inspiration, your creativity. It's all related and it's all absolutely accessible to you but in order to have access to better energy and creativity and flow states, we need to get into a general state of flow in our day-to-day -day life and in the way that we care about ourselves. So basic daily routine and self-care, though they may be basic, are so important. We absolutely have to start here. If we dove into the other concepts right away, we just wouldn't have anything to build on. So if you're familiar with Ayurveda, this might be a little redundant. That's okay. It's a good refresher and it's a good opportunity to really start holding yourself accountable for the practices that you know are going to make other practices um, possible, right? Building on top of one another, slow, sustainable shifts. So you've just learned a little bit about what to expect from this section um, in the intro. You've taken the dosha quiz to discover your dosha, and you've reviewed some reflection questions, which I will go over with you again here soon. So now in this lecture together, we're going to talk about why we're here. We're going to do a quick review on Ayurveda and the doshas. Um, we'll, we'll go over a few tips for balancing your doshas that will hopefully help inspire self-care later on. And then we'll get into why daily routine and self-care are important and how these concepts relate to work-life balance, how they support us to pursue our passions. From there, we'll go through step-by-step step, a basic foundational Ayurvedic routine, which is the true key to all other subsequent, subsequent wellness. And it is the true key to establishing the lifestyle that you want to live. From there, we'll get into some key self-care practices. Now, as I'm going through all of these items, I'll refer to some different activities and downloads and these are things that you will have access to um, after this lecture or if you want to go ahead and pause and download them now so that you can follow along that is okay too all right so let's go ahead and get into it you're here because you probably know that you could feel better than you do right now because you're craving structure and support that will take you to the next level. Maybe you're here because you're tired, you're uninspired, you're unmotivated, and you want to connect with your purpose. And you want to connect more deeply with a sense of caring for yourself. There are so many different factors that can bring us all into this place of saying, okay, something's just not right, and I'm ready to take action. And that is why you are here, because you are ready to take action to feel better, to connect more deeply with yourself, and to take yourself to the next level. 
of understanding your purpose, of being able to follow your passions, of feeling like you have the energy and the enthusiasm and the inspiration to be how you want to be in the world. That's what we're working toward together. And building the foundation of daily routine and self-care is the first step in getting there. So you've taken the mind-body quiz. You have a deeper understanding of how the doshas manifest within you. Ideally, you know one dosha that is sort of your strongest or most representative of who you are, even though we all have all three doshas, okay? Usually there's one that um, colors our personality and our body type just a little bit more. So keep that in mind as we move throughout this entire course because it will be helpful for um, fine tuning your own daily routine to be a bit more customized to your needs. Okay, so um, I know you've had a chance to review these reflection questions on your own, but I'm gonna share them with you again. Feel free to get out your journal if you haven't already. And I encourage you to answer any and all of these questions that call to you. Ideally, at least three, but as many more as you want. Feel free to pause as I'm reading them to allow yourself time to reflect and have the space to essentially prepare for what you're about to learn. That's why we reflect. That's why we, this is, reflection is like the tool to getting ourselves into a space of thinking more critically so that we can start to break down the circumstances that are holding us back, the limiting beliefs that are preventing us from just doing the damn thing, from having a routine, from taking better care of ourselves. So let's start to break this apart now so that when it's time to implement the practices, you are mentally and emotionally ready to do that, All right? So if you wanna grab your notebook, please do. And I'm gonna share these with you. What is your relationship like to routine? Do you avoid it? Do you crave it? Does something about it feel unattainable to you? Hmm. How do you define self-care? When do you feel most deserving of self-care practices? When is it most challenging to care for yourself? Those two questions I think are really interesting because often we feel the most deserving of self-care when we're already doing a good job taking care of ourselves and we're already motivated and in a flow of waking up and eating vegetables and staying positive. That's when we want to do more and more and more. We often have feel the least deserving or have the most challenges incorporating self-care practices when we need them the most when we're struggling the most, when we're having the hardest time. Why is that? That's something that we should really start to break apart so that self-care becomes more accessible to you in an ongoing way and not just when you're already feeling good. Although that's great too. It's important to think about these other key moments that we really can and should be caring for ourselves. Okay, next question. What are three core things that you do every single day or almost every single day? Okay, think of three core things already in your life. Some people say, oh, I, I don't have a routine. I can't have a routine. If there are three things that you already do right now, you have a routine. You have the foundation for a routine. So think of the stuff, whether or not it feels like self-care or not, think of the things that you do every day. That's a routine and that is the foundation for bringing in practices more intentionally, knowing that you can already do it because there already are things that you just do every single day. What are three things that you do sometimes but would like to do every day? This is cool because it's gonna help us move into goal setting and accountability when we, when we start to bring in more practices. If you already have some things in mind that you want to bring into your daily routine, 
then those are going to be the first goals you set for yourself. So maybe sometimes you drink lemon honey water and you know you like that, um, but you don't do it every day, but you want to do it every day. Okay. Keep those in mind. And those are going to be the first goals that you set for yourself because we, we should, it feels better to do the things that call to us. So initially when we're setting goals and we're bringing in practices, I want you to choose the practices that feel most exciting to you. I want this to be fun for you and enjoyable. Okay. So think of the things that you want to be doing more of that you're excited about. That's where we're going to start with goal setting. Okay. Next question. How can you be more gentle with yourself? What would it look like to be patient with your process? This is a big one. Lack of patience and lack of gentleness can be huge barriers in achieving wellness because if we're not patient, if we're not gentle, we might just say, fuck it. I didn't, I didn't do my routine yesterday. I'm bad. I messed up. I can't do it. And that's just it. Versus being gentle and being patient enough to say, okay, yesterday or today was really hard and I'm going to try again tomorrow. I'm only going to do three practices tomorrow because that's all I have the energy for right now. And that is okay because it's better to do something than to do nothing. And I know that these things will help me feel better. Okay, so what would it look like to be patient with your process, to be more gentle with yourself? That's absolutely a part of how we're going to move through building in daily routine and self-care so that it actually lasts. How do you feel when you get into a routine? What do you notice in other parts of your life as a result? Do you notice that you feel better, more energized, more excited, more inspired when you're in sort of a good flow in your day to day? What do you think when you see other people in a steady routine? Do you think, wow, that's so amazing. She wakes up at 6 a.m. every day. Maybe I could do that. Or do you think, Oh, she, she can only do that because she has more time than I do. Do you notice excuses and judgments? Do you notice inspiration? What do you notice when you see other people thriving in routine? What about when you see other people practicing self-care? Do you notice that you feel unworthy? Or again, do you feel inspired to say, okay, if they're caring for themselves like that, I can too. Just notice. What comes up? Again, take some time to finish answering as many of those questions as you'd like, and then meet me back here to continue on. Okay, so we're about to get into the good stuff. We're about to start talking about how to dial in your daily routine to experience more sustained energy and focus throughout the day. You're going to learn how to optimize your physical and mental wellness through the structure of an Ayurvedic daily routine that will easily integrate into your lifestyle, right? So this isn't about doing something totally different. This is about integrating practices and routine into your lifestyle, into your work schedule, into your family culture so that it works for you. Um, we'll also talk about key self-care rituals that you can be doing from home to manage stress and support your mood. Ayurveda is all about making slow, sustainable shifts to feel better in your body, which is something we could all really use right now. Okay. So let's just do a quick review. I know you might already be familiar with Ayurveda, but it doesn't hurt to have a reminder, especially when we're in this phase of really building a foundation for wellness. So what is Ayurveda? Ayurveda is an ancient system of healing, a full spectrum system of healing. It is holistic. 
When I say full spectrum and I say holistic, what I mean is it not is it's not just supplementation. It's not just herbs. It's not just diet. It's not just lifestyle. It is holistic. It is the full spectrum of your experience. So we're talking about mental and emotional wellness. We're talking about breath work and meditation. The way that we think and feel about ourselves and others is absolutely a part of the experience that we're considering when we think about how to find balance through Ayurveda. So yes, it is about diet and lifestyle and daily routine, but it's also about the whole human experience and what it's going to take for you to find balance and to reconnect with yourself from moment to moment, from day to day, from week to week. And that looks a bit different for everyone. Ayurveda is really about catering to the individual's needs, which is why it's important to have an understanding of your constitution or of your dominant dosha. If you know which dosha is the strongest within you, you know which dosha you're generally paying a little extra attention to, to keep in balance. Ayurveda is about connecting to the rhythms of nature. It's about reconnecting to what our body naturally wants to do, which is to wake with the sun and go to sleep when the sun sets, to eat soup in the winter and go swimming in the summer. All of these things that we naturally crave um, are, are our body's wisdom within the Ayurvedic paradigm, which is really about reconnecting with ourselves by reconnecting with nature. I mean, we are a part of nature. Um, it's about learning how to listen to our bodies, to know that so often we are intuitively craving exactly what we need for balance in any given moment. But in this Western world, we've come so far away from listening to our bodies. We're so infiltrated with recommendations and tips and fads of all these things that we should be doing to look a certain way. Ayurveda asks you to look within and to say, okay, how am I feeling? What elements are coming up in my body, in my mind? And what can I do to balance them, to support myself, to feel better in this moment? What could I eat? What activity could I do? Should I go for a walk? Should I meditate? Tuning in to listen to your body reconnecting to your wisdom is the art of Ayurveda. And it is the foundation to feeling better, to finding work-life balance, to connecting with flow states of energy and inspiration and joy and self-reliance. All of that comes when we reconnect with ourselves, when we reconnect with the world around us and the elements. Um, so within Ayurveda, you know, it's based on a system of the elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. We group those elements into three groups called the doshas. We then use the doshas to help us define or identify our experience, our personalities, but also experiences around us. We can use them to describe the elements or the seasons in addition to foods and activities, okay? Okay. So there are three doshas. There's vata, which is a combination of air and space. People with a lot of vata dosha tend to be very creative, very inspired, a little more spontaneous, um, talkative even, uh, prone to a bit more anxiety and stress. You can see how all of those qualities that I've just described actually relate to the qualities of wind. They're sort of light and quick. Ayurveda is very intuitive in that way. So next, we have pitta dosha. Pitta is a combination of the fire and water elements, but think of it mostly as fire. So people with a lot of pitta in their constitution tend to be more fiery people. They're very passionate, they're focused, they're organized, they're strategizers, they're problem solvers. Um, they tend to experience a bit more like anger and frustration, impatience, stuff like that, more fiery experiences. Um, and then there's kapha dosha. Kapha is a combination of the earth and water elements, and that is my dominant dosha. So people with a lot of kapha dosha tend to be very loyal and patient and forgiving. 
very enduring. Um, and, and they can also be a bit stubborn. I know I am. Um, and more prone to depression. So all of those qualities that I've just described, you can see how they relate more to earth and water. They're a bit heavier and slower, a bit more grounded. Okay. So that's a little reminder about all of the doshas. And now before we get into daily routine, I just want to offer some quick tips for keeping your doshas healthy and balanced. Okay, we're gonna go through each dosha. I'm gonna give you three tips to balance each dosha. And so if that dosha that I list is your dominant dosha, those are the tips that you're gonna to wanna to focus on. And we're just going over this now because this is part of the foundational understanding and hopefully it'll help you hone in on ways to sort of refine or fine tune your self care, which we'll get into later to suit your doshic needs even more. All right, quick tips for balancing doshas. And just note, um, there'll be a PDF that you can download with these reminders after this lecture. Okay, so for Vata, to keep Vata happy, for Vata type people, you really wanna to commit to a regular daily and or weekly routine. Keep it consistent. Okay, so routine is important for all of us, absolutely, but it is most important and most challenging for Vata type people because they have this very active energy, much like the wind, and they have a hard time um, with consistency and stability. So keep Vata happy by really prioritizing routine. Um, next way to keep Vata happy is to eat well-cooked, well-spiced foods. Avoid foods that are cold and dry and light and rough, like raw salad, raw vegetables. Um, that can be really aggravating or imbalancing to Vata dosha especially. And the last tip to balancing vata dosha or to keeping vata happy is to massage the soles of your feet with oil before bed. It's going to be very grounding and soothing to bring down that sort of busy, active energy of vata dosha. All right, let's talk about some quick tips to keeping pitta dosha healthy and happy. One, Limit the amount of spicy and salty taste that you consume. These tastes are both very heating. So you can have them in moderation, but really just like lay off the hot sauce if you're a pitta type person um, because it can aggravate excess heat in the body and actually make us a little bit more irritable and things like that. Um, another way to balance pitta dosha, especially for pitta type people, is to avoid the heat of direct sun, especially for extended periods of time. And lastly, you can keep pitta dosha happy by spritzing yourself with rose water. This is something that is great for all of us in the summer, and it's great for pitta dosha year round. Rose is very cooling and soothing, and those are qualities that are especially balancing to a more fiery person. All right, and to keep kapha dosha happy, first thing you want to do is get moving vigorous, more vigorous exercise such as jogging, cycling, and dance can really help keep kapha balanced and light and activated because it does have more of those heavy and slow qualities. Another way to keep kapha dosha happy and healthy is to limit the amount of dairy in your diet. For me as a kapha person, I really don't buy dairy in my home other than ghee and occasionally goat yogurt. Um, and that's one way that I just that I just keep my dairy intake low. I mostly only eat it if I'm out. Um, the qualities of dairy are just like kapha dosha. They're heavy and slow, and they can, they can make a kapha person feel particularly sluggish. Last tip for keeping kapha happy and healthy is to add plenty of spices to your food, like cumin, black pepper, ginger, things that will heat your food up and, and get your body moving, get your digestion moving just a bit more are going to be really key for kapha. Okay, so keep those tips in mind, um, especially for your individual dosha type, and know that you can also download a PDF with reminders for all of those. And now we're ready to get into a conversation about daily routine. Why is daily routine important? So think about this. 
how do you feel when you get into a routine? What changes for you? Do you get more done? Are you happier? Are you nicer? Is it easy for you to remember to do the things that you need to do? I know that's true for me. I'm in a way better mood when I have some semblance of routine. Doesn't have to be super rigid, but just a few things that I know I'll do every day um, really put me in a better mood and, and help me feel like I have more time to get other things done in between. So the thing about daily routine is that it offers us structure and structure helps reduce stress and anxiety by balancing vata dosha. Vata dosha is the one that gets most aggravated when we're feeling stressed. Even if you're not a vata dominant person, you can absolutely experience vata imbalances like stress. So one way to prevent excess vata that would lead to stress in the body is to have the structure of a daily routine. Daily routine also frees up the mind for creativity and productivity rather than thinking, okay, what do I need to do now? Oh, what do I need to do now? What am I forgetting? Those thoughts can really distract us and take us out of our flow. But if you know what your routine is, if you know, okay, I'm working right now and then I'm going to drink tea later, you, you can just move from one thing to the next without wasting time in between wondering what's, what's the best thing for me to be doing now. You'll just already know. And then when you have that space in between your tasks, you can say, okay, I know I've done everything I need to do today and now I'm feeling inspired to read my book. Or I'm having this really good idea and I can just get into it because I know exactly what I've done and what I need to be doing and the space that I have in between for creativity and productivity. So good. Um, another great thing about daily routine is that it, it gives us the opportunity to realign with the natural cycles of nature which is exactly what our bodies crave. We are animals, we are part of nature, and it is within us to connect with the flow of nature. So a daily routine really helps us dial in our sleep schedule, which is one of the biggest keys of being in a flow with nature. Um, daily routine also helps us achieve our goals and it gives us tools for accountability and tools to stay motivated. <sighs> so important when we're talking about finding work-life balance and when we're talking about connecting with our purpose and our passions, in order to move through those processes, we need to have goals that we're setting for ourselves and achieving and setting and achieving. And daily routine supports us in the process of setting and achieving our goals. It also helps us use our time better, which I sort of alluded to earlier, um, so that we actually feel like we have more time throughout the day. That is absolutely true. I can't tell you how many times I've been out of a routine and I just sort of like roam around the house and I think about, oh, should I do this? Or, yeah, well, maybe I could do this or I could do that. And suddenly two hours passes and I didn't do any of the things that I thought about doing in that time. So when we give ourselves just a loose daily routine that even just suggests certain things that we could be doing at certain times, it acts as a reminder to help us say, oh yeah, in the afternoon before dinner, I like to read my book. I like to do self-study. I like to listen to the news rather than just roaming around. <laughs> um, and so when we use our time well like that, we actually feel like we have more time because suddenly in those two hours, instead of just wondering, hmm, what should I do? Should I go over here? Should I think about this? I spent an hour reading my book. I finished reading my book. I cleaned the kitchen. I went for a walk. I called my friend. I did all of the things that felt best and most life-giving for me in the moment because I had just enough structure to remind myself what, what I like to do and what feels good for me every single day. Okay, so why is self-care important? 
this is this is the key to everything this is a real part of our philosophy with cultivate balance the better care we take of ourselves the better care we can take of others, the better we're able to show up for our families, the community, and the planet. Self-care isn't selfish. You may have heard someone say that before. You might have even rolled your eyes, but I'm serious. Self-care is the key to doing anything else in the world. If you feel bad, if you feel tired, if you feel uninspired, do you think you're going to go to that protest? Do you think you're going to remember to take out the trash? Do you think you're going to speak kindly to your coworkers, maybe you're going to have a lot more energy to do those things if you feel good and happy and centered and cared for. And that's not something that you can seek from other people. It has to start with you. Caring for yourself is the key to caring for others and to really having the capacity to do your work in the world, to live your passions and to show up for others. It is so, so important. And often you'll hear me talk about this idea of radical self-care. What, is, what does radical mean when we talk about being self-care? It's, it's the idea that self-care is the first step in, in a revolution. Self-care is the first step in your activism. It is the thing that will enable you to live your truth and to live authentically. Um, Self-care is not fancy, just buying fancy skincare. It doesn't have to be expensive. Self-care isn't always fun. It's not always easy. That's another radical part of self-care. I think sometimes people think, well, if I'm not feeling better right away, then it's not working. That's not true. Meditation, for example, is one of those self-care practices that is pretty radical because it doesn't always feel great in the moment. Sometimes it feels really hard. Sometimes you experience a lot of resistance and the radical part is overcoming that resistance to say, I know this is going to help me down the road. I know this is going to help me feel better tonight. So I'm going to do it now, even though I'm not in the mood, even though it's not easy. That is radical self-care. Self-care is a practice of being kind and intentional with yourself. So many of us experience shame, experience unworthiness, where we think we don't deserve to feel cared for. We don't deserve to feel loved. And that prevents us from caring and loving, caring for and loving other people to our fullest capacity. So we have to break down those barriers to know that we are absolutely worthy of our own care and of our own love if we want to be able to show up for anyone else in the world, for anything else in the world. If we want to be better at our jobs, we start by caring for ourselves to improve our mood, to improve our energy so that we, we can really experience what we're capable of. That is the essence of self-care. It is not selfish. It is critical. It is not expensive. It is not inaccessible. It is about being intentional with yourself. It is the daily practice of being kind to yourself, of checking in with yourself and saying, how am I feeling today? What do I need right now? It might be different than yesterday. Whew, that's real. So we've, I've alluded to this a bit in the last 10 minutes or so, but how does daily routine support work-life balance? How does self-care support us to pursue our passions? We need the structures of daily routine and self-care to establish balance in our lives, which includes work-life balance. The more we build in these structures and this self-care, which fosters self-love, the more clearly we can connect to our passions and understand, oh, this is actually who I am. This is actually what matters to me. This is how I want to show up in the world. Again, it brings us to a place of being more intentional. When we care for ourselves and we feel into our needs, when we feel into our intentions, we get more clear about what we have to offer to the world 
and what we're going to do to offer it. Yes. It's big. I know. And, and I've said this, this daily routine stuff is going to seem really simple and that's fine because you've just heard all of the reasons why it's the most important thing you can be doing for yourself right now. The very most important thing you can be doing so that you can do anything else, whether that's raise your children, whether that's write a book, whether that's work for work a nine to five, whatever it is that you're doing right now will benefit if you take care of yourself. Part of taking care of yourself is building in a routine so that you remember to care for yourself every single day. This is an ongoing practice. So we are going to get into a basic Ayurvedic routine. Yes. And I'm going to, am I going to screen share that with you? I'm going to go through it and then I'll screen share it. Okay. So basically from an Ayurvedic perspective, you want to wake up early. You want to wake up with the sun or just before the sun to capture the momentum to get yourself up and moving. If you sleep in long past the sun, um, you'll actually find that it's harder to get up, that you feel heavier and slower and more tired. So if you can wake up with the sun, you'll actually feel that energy of the rising sun to get yourself up and out of bed, to start your day. Next key item in an Ayurvedic daily routine is to just take three deep breaths of gratitude from your bed. <sighs> take two more with me. <sighs> One more. <sighs> yeah, three deep breaths of gratitude before you look at your phone, before you pick up a screen, before you start thinking about all the things you need to do. Just pause and appreciate. You can look at something beautiful. Sometimes I like to look out the window. Sometimes I look at a plant or a piece of art and just experience gratitude. This is a real key way in starting your day, like setting a tone for your entire day. If you start your day and you wake up and you're crabby and you don't want to get out of bed, how do you think you're going to continue to feel? And what choices are you going to make throughout your day as a result of feeling bad when you woke up? Okay, so just prevent that by pausing and taking three deep breaths of gratitude. Don't get on your screen. Don't do anything else. Just appreciate. You can send gratitude to a person that you love, or you can send gratitude to yourself. You can just think of something that's happened in your life recently that you're really grateful for. That's the second thing you do when you, after you open your eyes in the morning. Once you're out of bed, you want to scrape your tongue right away. You might notice some mornings when you wake up, your tongue has a pretty intense, like whitish coating. That is a sign of toxins in your body. Most people have some level of coating throughout the day. You might notice some mornings it's worse, some mornings it's less worse. Um, the days that it's worse are usually when you've eaten something the day before that you know your body doesn't digest that well, or when you've had a lot of alcohol or a lot of dairy or a lot of gluten, things like that. So we scrape our tongue in the morning. You want to get a metal tongue scraper. I'll link to it later so that you can find a place to order one if you don't have one already. Um, and so in addition to scraping off those toxins that have built up on your tongue so you're not re-ingesting them, you're also cleansing your tongue so that you can actually better experience taste, which is a key in Ayurveda. The six tastes are a big part of Ayurvedic wellness because each taste corresponds with a different bodily organ. The experience of taste is actually the first step in the digestive process because when we experience a different taste on the tongue, for example, you eat something bitter like cooked kale or arugula, 
the bitter spot, the liver spot actually on the tongue experiences the bitter taste, sends a message to the liver to say, hey, start producing more bile. Let's get this digestive process going so that you're ready to break down this food as it makes its way through. So it's a part, having a clean and clear tongue is a part of the communication process that happens in the earliest stages of our digestion. Additionally, each spot on the tongue corresponds with a different organ. So when we scrape the tongue, it activates and awakens all of our bodily organs to get going. It acts as a cue that it's time to start the day and to start processing. Very, very important, very simple. It feels so good. Once you start scraping your tongue, you will not go back. And some people ask like, well, I, I brush it with a toothbrush. Is that enough? No, it's not. You need a metal, like a stainless steel or copper tongue scraper, and you want to use a fair bit of pressure so that your tongue is clean. Okay. So then after you scrape your tongue, you're going to sip warm lemon or lime honey water. So what I generally do is fill up a cup or a glass, like half full with just boiled water, the rest with room temperature. I add just a squeeze of lemon or lime, like a half or a full teaspoon of honey and stir it in. When it's room temperature, it's great because you can just drink it right away. You don't have to wait for it to cool down. Or I'm sorry, when it's warm, when it's warm, but not burning hot. Um, and, and warm beverages also absorb more readily, so it will help your body hydrate first thing in the morning, will hydrate your colon, your digestive system, so that encourages bowel movement. The lemon or lime encourages just a gentle daily detoxification. The honey has a bit of a scraping quality, so it will help move things through your digestive system. Um, and some people ask, when should I have lemon? When should I have lime? You know, you can really go with personal preference. Lime is going to be um, a little more on the bitter side, uh, which means that it's slightly more cooling. So lime is going to be better in hotter seasons or for pitta type people. But either one is going to be a great option for starting that gentle daily detox, for activating digestion and for hydrating your body all of which will set you off to a great start for your day. And it's very, very easy to do. All right, next thing in your basic daily routine is to move your body. Whether that's walking or stretching or yoga, maybe it's only 15 minutes, maybe it's an hour, you decide what you have time for in your schedule. Again, we're integrating into your schedule. We're not changing everything. So figure out what kind of movement would feel good for you to do in the morning. Maybe it's just a walk around the neighborhood, you listen to a podcast, and that is your morning movement. After that, you want to eat warm cooked foods for breakfast. Um, ideally, some vegetables. I like to have like cooked kale with an egg that has turmeric on it and um, like a really nice fry toast. Quinoa is a great breakfast option. You can make it into a porridge with coconut milk and cinnamon and ghee. Um, but you want it to be warm because that will help support digestion and really nourish your body. And then you'll get into your work day or whatever else you need to do. And later in the course, we'll talk more about this sort of in-between time and how to best use your work time for certain types of projects based on how the doshas manifest in the day. That's a whole thing that we're going to get into. It's very interesting. It's been very helpful for me and for my clients, and that's why I want to share it with you. But first, as I've said before, we are building the foundation, keeping it simple. So then let's move along to the next part of your day, lunch. You want to make sure lunch is your biggest meal, ideally between 10 and 2 p.m. Because when the sun is highest in the sky, digestive capacity is strongest. So this means it is your biggest chance to more optimally absorb and assimilate nutrients into tissue in your body, into energy, into what becomes you. Your highest capacity for digestion is when the sun is highest in the sky. Then 
next daily routine item would be to take a 10 to 15 minute walk after lunch. This will help support digestion so that you don't feel that sort of tired, heavy crash after lunch that a lot of people experience. Um, it keeps our energy lifted, it keeps our mood lifted, but mostly it's really, really good for digestion actually to walk after every meal, but especially lunch because it is such a bummer to feel tired in the middle of your workday when you know you have stuff that you just have to get done. And then another great daily routine practice is to breathe deeply. So we're getting into the afternoon. Um, a really good practice, like right before dinner, like a transition practice uh, around five when you finish work and come home, is to practice alternate nostril breathing, which I'll teach you about in a video coming up if you don't already know, so get ready for that. Um, but just coming home and practicing Deep breathing and mindfulness as a transition out of your workday is going to be so, so valuable for mitigating stress, for bringing you back into your body, for experiencing calmness and relaxation and really easing into the rest of your evening to feel really good. So in addition to breathing deeply with a breathing practice like alternate nostril breath, which we'll get into, um, other forms of mindfulness like meditation and journaling, even just reading a book are really great habits or practices to get into before dinner. And then you'll have dinner. Dinner is generally a lighter meal as the sun goes down, so does digestive fire. After dinner, a great daily routine item is to sip warm herbal tea. Um, you know, warm beverages absorb more readily in the body. So again, that's supporting hydration. It's also supporting digestion. It's also going to help your body feel calm and grounded as you transition into the evening. Next, you want to turn off electronics, ideally by 9 p.m., one hour before bed. Turn off electronics. Our screens and our computers and our TVs radiate blue to white light, which is activating to our bodies. It, it messes with our circadian rhythms and ultimately tells us that we should be awake. So if you can wind down and turn off electronics up to an hour before bed, your, your body's gonna feel calmer and it's gonna understand that it's time to rest rather than reactivate. Um, and also images from our computers, in addition to affecting our circadian rhythms, it, it keeps our minds busy and distracted. Um, and, and that's really the opposite of what we want as we're preparing for bed. Next practice is one of my very favorites, legs up the wall. A really, really great way to wind down and set yourself up for a great night's sleep. So to do this practice, you're going to Find a wall that you can scoot your body up really close to. I usually scoot one hip up. I lie back on my shoulders, on my elbows, slide my legs up the wall so that I'm making an L shape, scoot my glutes in toward the wall, and let my head rest back. I close my eyes, I rest my arms at my sides or on my belly and my heart, and just breathe deeply. It's really great for circulation to have the legs up in the air like that. Um, it helps send more blood flow to our hearts and to our brains, which indicates to our nervous systems that we can be relaxing, that it's okay to wind down. So if you can stay in this position for at least 10 minutes, sometimes I stay in it for 20, I stay in it till my feet like start to tingle a little bit and then I come out. Um, but it really helps bring me into a super, super deep state of relaxation that just gets me ready to go to bed. Um, last practice before going to sleep after sending your legs up the wall is to massage the soles of your feet with oil. I mentioned this as a vata soothing practice earlier, but it's great for all of us, especially for balancing our energies from the day, for grounding our minds and our bodies so that we can prepare to rest. So massage the soles of the feet with oil, like a sunflower oil or almond are going to be good for most people. Um, not coconut oil, it's a little too cooling. 
Um, you can use a very small amount of oil and just rub it in really nicely. You can sleep with socks on. It usually doesn't get on my sheets if I use a small amount, but experiment with that. It's a really, really nice practice. It takes just a couple minutes. It feels so good. And then lastly, go to sleep by 10 p.m. So you turned your electronics off at nine, you did your legs up the wall, you oiled your feet. Now it's 10 and it's time to go to sleep. Um, if we stay up much later past 10, we often feel reactivated. It's the surge of pitta energy coming through again, which we'll get into more um, as we continue to refine and align routine. We'll get into that a bit later. But just know that if you stay up past 10 p.m., it's probably going to be harder to fall asleep than if you're in bed with your eyes closed at 9.45. I experienced that for sure. Um, and the better quality sleep we have, the easier it is to fall asleep, the easier it is to wake up the next morning and start your routine all over again. So I really encourage you to prioritize going to sleep by 10 p.m. because it's the quickest way to set yourself up for success tomorrow. So I'm just going to screen share a basic daily routine checklist that you can download just to recap on some of the items that we have just chatted about. Okay, so this in this document, all the practices are built in the times of day. You can see you can set up an affirmation at the top. This is the one I'm recommending. I am caring for myself so I can better care for others. And then we get into the practices, wake up with or just before the sun, scrape the tongue and brush the teeth, drink warm lemon or lime honey water, exercise and or stretch. Then we get into midday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's when you engage in mentally stimulating activities, which we'll talk more about soon. You eat your largest meal. You take a walk after lunch. In the afternoon, it's a great time to sip herbal tea, as well as to practice mindfulness like meditating, journaling, reading, and pranayama, breath work, which isn't listed, but that's another one. In the evening, you want to eat a lighter dinner before dark, drink a cup of soothing herbal tea or golden milk. That's a good option. Massage the soles of your feet with almond oil or sunflower and go to sleep by 10 p.m. All right, so this is your basic daily routine checklist. You can go ahead and download that whenever you're ready. And that gives you all of the practices. Um, you're also going to have access to a template where you can sort of build in your own additional practices, set your own goals, and move things around in a different order if the order of this one isn't quite right for you. Okay, and so let's talk about tips for making your own daily routine. Um, this will come into play when you get into the daily routine template. Um, but I recommend breaking the day up into three or four sections. So like you saw on that daily routine checklist, there was morning, midday, afternoon, and evening. If we can sort of section our day off like that, um, it gives us more digestible pieces of our routine and self-care items rather than thinking of a list of 10 things, you're thinking of just two or three things at a time. Um, so break your day up into four sections and then um, go ahead and just, well, you'll, you'll customize your template, right? Or take the one that I've given and then you want to print it out and put it somewhere that you can see it every day. So maybe that's in your bathroom, maybe that's on the fridge, maybe you screenshot it and set it as the background of your phone. Part of accountability is returning to the routine, giving ourselves these reminders to really make it happen. Um, something that Sierra likes to do, Sierra is the other co-founder of Cultivate Balance, she will laminate her daily routine checklist and use a marker to check everything off every day. And that's very satisfying to her. So um, figure out what works for you in terms of accountability and visibility, print it out, and make sure that when you're making your own daily routine, that you're putting things on it that sound enjoyable to you. This should be fun. Daily routine is fun. It should feel good. I'm not going to say that it's, super, that it's easy, but we, we want to keep it fun and interesting 
when we can so that we're more inspired to stick to it. Um, and also, don't try everything at once, okay? It's really about weaving things in slowly. So even though I've given you this whole daily routine, right now I'm giving you sort of the bigger vision of what is possible. But try to start with three daily routine items that you're really, really going to commit to. And then once you've dialed those in, bring in three more. And then bring in three more. And that is how you build a lasting routine. And so soon you will have an opportunity to download this accountability chart. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so in this accountability chart, you'll see that you can select three items that you're gonna do for one week at a time. And every day, you can, hand, you can print this out, you can handwrite the items in, and every day you'll check off the three when you do them. And then the next week you can decide, okay, am I doing those three items again or am I layering in three new items? And you write those on, write those down, and you're going to check them off every day. And same for week three. So that is an activity that's coming up um, to just give you more accountability and to help you understand how to bring in practices slowly so that you stay motivated and feel like you have the time and the space to do just a few things at a time rather than doing everything at a time. I feel like that can be the biggest barrier for people. I've had clients say to me, oh yeah, I learned about Ayurveda a few years ago, but it, it felt like too much. It felt like I had to do all this stuff that just didn't feel possible for me, so instead I did none of it. And that, that's not what we're about right here. If, if you need to choose one practice, lemon honey water, or waking up at 6 a.m. that you do every day for the next month until you're ready and inspired and excited to bring in another practice, that is absolutely fine, okay? We want to make this possible. We want to make this lasting so that when we get to the more complex ideas for really refining and aligning routine that you are ready for it. And so as you know, I recommend taking this first section, this first module, over about a week. But if you need more time to integrate some of these more basic practices, give yourself two weeks, give yourself three weeks, and then go through section two, okay? Build a strong foundation so that you experience true and lasting success in your wellness goals and in your work-life balance. All right, so we've talked about the basic daily routine what it looks like and why each item is important. Let's just talk about some additional self-care rituals. So these are more of weekly practices than daily practices. So the first one, one that's really good, especially right now when um, like sicknesses are going around is to gargle salt and turmeric water, probably in the morning, but any time of day is good. So you'll, take a small glass of warm water, warm, warm to hot, just not so you'll, you'd burn yourself, add about a half teaspoon of salt, a quarter teaspoon of turmeric, mix it up, let it dissolve a little bit, pour some in your mouth, tip your head back and gurgle. Ugh. Yep, and then spit it out and do that a couple of times until all the water is gone. Um, and that's one way to fight off bacteria in the throat, and it's really good for just supporting immunity by preventing, um, preventing disease and sickness that can arise when we're, you know, transferring germs. Okay, next self-care ritual that you could be doing weekly or a couple of times a week, I suppose any of these practices you could do a couple of times a week, um, is oil pulling. This is a really popular practice within Ayurveda. It's one that's made its way a bit into the mainstream, so you may have heard about it. Um, but oil pulling is a practice that helps draw bacteria out of the gums and out of the mouth. Uh, I, I really like it for teeth whitening. My, my teeth are too sensitive to use a whitening toothpaste, but oil pulling once a week helps keep my teeth pretty white and bright, which I love, and it helps make my mouth feel clean. And I'm very into oral hygiene. 
So in addition to the saltwater gargle for oral hygiene, you can also oil pull. So to do this practice, you'll take mm, about like a teaspoon to a tablespoon of coconut oil, put it in your mouth. You can bite it up just a bit to break it so it's all liquid if it's not already soft. And then you're gonna swish it around your mouth for about 15 minutes if you can. 15 to even 20 is really good. Um, you'll wanna like draw it through your teeth and really swish it all around the tongue and the mouth. Um, and then you'll spit it out in the compost or in the trash can. And then I usually like to rinse like to drink a little warm water or a warm salt water, swish it around a little bit to get the oil texture out of my mouth and then spit it out. Sometimes I like to oil pull and then go right into a salt turmeric water gargle and that feels really good for me too. Um, oil pulling is best done on an empty stomach. So it's a good practice to do like after you have your lemon honey water. Sometimes I do it or even before just after you've scraped your tongue. Sometimes I do it while I'm just like making my bed and getting ready for the day and then 20 minutes goes by really quick for, um, yeah, oral hygiene, teeth whitening, things like that. Um, so good, so good. Okay, another key self-care practice that you can be doing weekly is oiling your entire body and bathing. So the practice of oiling the body is called abhyanga. Um, and, and part of this practice is to oil your feet every night, but to do the full thing would be to massage the whole body with oil. It's so grounding. It's so nourishing. It's so good for overall health and vitality and rejuvenation. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a really sweet, sweet practice for self-love. And it's a practice that I encourage you to do, um, if you're, having a hard time relating to your body, especially it, doing Abhyanga has really helped me overcome some things with body image because you just have to spend time with your body. Um, so to do this practice, you're going to take some oil, almond oil, sunflower oil, sesame oil is a bit more heating, but also great. Um, ideally you'd warm it up if you have time. So in order to do that, usually I pour some hot water into a mug and just drop my jar of oil in the mug, swirl it around, let it get a little warm, put some oil in my hands, spread it just generally over your whole body, just get it everywhere. And then you'll go ahead and rub it in. So to rub in the oil, you're going to do long strokes on the bones and circular strokes on the joints going toward the heart circular strokes on the joint, same on the other arm, circle, long strokes toward the heart, um, same on the legs, you want to try and do the fingers and the toes, and when you get to the belly, you'll go clockwise, looking down, that's the direction of digestion, um, you'll want to do, you know, your back, your shoulders, your hips, circles on the hips, right, those are a joint, you can massage your head, um, and, and just, just, do your, your whole body, cover your whole body in oil. It's, it's such a luxury. Um, and then ideally, traditionally, you would take a hot shower or bath, um, which I know can seem sort of counterintuitive, but actually the heat from the water helps open up your pores to better absorb the oil. Um, and so, so it's more effective. You can do it after. Sometimes if I'm I'm sort of in a rush and I don't have time to really get into the whole practice. I'll just oil my body right after the shower when, when my skin is still a bit warm and I feel like my pores are still pretty open. Um, and just a note, oil is, if, if you have access to body oil, to just a basic almond or sunflower or massage oil, um, I'm, I'm going to recommend that over lotion any day because lotion is basically a mixture of oil and water. Um, and in order to keep those things together without going rancid, they have to add preservatives. Body oil is like the original lotion without preservatives. Um, and especially if you warm it up, a little bit goes a long way. If your body is warm, it will absorb so quickly and it's very nourishing. I mean, our skin is the largest organ on our body, so why not nourish it? Mm. I love Abhyanga. Okay, last self-care practice that you could be doing weekly 
is dry brushing. And this is another Ayurvedic practice that you may have heard of. It's a practice that's a bit more activating. It's good for exfoliation. It's good for moving lymph and for getting energized. So I recommend doing this practice in the morning. It's great to do before a shower in the morning. And similar technique to massaging the body with oil, you're going to take a gentle natural bristle brush or um, a raw silk glove. I'll link to that also. Um, and you're going to do long strokes on the bone, circular strokes on the joints. Same thing as Abhyanga, but with a dry brush. This is an activating practice. It's great for the spring. It's great for kapha dosha. If you have more sensitive skin, I would recommend using the raw silk glove over the brush, over the natural bristled brush. Okay, those are some key self-care practices that you can be weaving in every week. Salt turmeric gargle, oil pulling, abhyanga with a hot bath or shower, and dry brushing. Um, and all of these practices do exactly what self-care is meant to do, which is they invite you to be intentional and kind to yourself, which then leads us to be more intentional and kind to others. So think about some of those practices that I've just mentioned and figure out which one you're going to try this week. And let's go over just a couple discussion questions. So I want you to think about some, what's something that you could do less of to create space for the things that you want to do more of. What would it take to do less of that thing? Would it involve setting a designated time, time of day, or a certain duration of time that you do that thing? Maybe it's social media. Um, or maybe it's just certain days that you do that thing that you're trying to do less of, but it's not every day. What Ayurvedic practices do you already implement? So now that I've gone over a bunch of practices, maybe you saw some and you thought, oh, I already scrape my tongue. Oh, I already dry brush. What do you already implement? Celebrate yourself for that. And know that, you, that you've, you've already got to start on your daily routine and on your self-care because you're already doing it. What's one thing you're going to implement tomorrow? What about routine or self-care still feels sort of limiting or accessible? Continue to tease out that question and your answers to it so that you can understand your limiting beliefs and your subconscious barriers so that you can overcome them to do the damn thing. Um, yeah. How does what your body intuitively craves align with what you've learned about the doshas? Maybe you're a pitta type person and when I said, eat less spicy food, you said, oh yeah, I noticed that I feel super irritable when I eat hot sauce, or I'm really sensitive to spice on my food. How, how have the things that I've shared with you today sort of aligned with how you already are or how you know you want to be? That is your intuitive craving for alignment. That is your body trying to align with the rhythms of nature. All right. So we have just learned a lot. We've talked about a basic Ayurvedic daily routine, how it relates to work-life balance, how it helps us achieve our purpose. We've talked about self-care and why it matters. All of this is the foundation for everything that we'll get to throughout the course. Later, we're going to be getting into more, more in depth of how the doshas relate to the different times of day so that you can truly access more creativity, so that you can be more intentional with your time, so that you can get into more flow states. All of that is coming, so stay with me um, and, and really commit to building the foundation that we have learned about today really connect with tools for accountability, holding yourself accountable so that you make it happen and take as much time as you need to integrate some of these basic practices so that you are ready for the next step when we get to section two, okay? So what's next in this section? You're about to have a quiz to test your learning, to just check in on what you've learned and what you remember from this lecture. 
and you'll have the opportunity to download the basic daily routine checklist. You'll get to do an activity where you take the basic daily routine as a template and make it your own. I'm gonna remind you of some action steps that might be really good to prioritize if you're not sure where to start. And then you'll have another activity to print out and utilize the accountability chart that I shared. Okay, um, and, and there will also be meditation and um, breath work and, and a few more activities and short videos and reminders coming from me. Um, and then we'll wrap up this section and you'll get into another section um, where we take you through an intro and reflection questions and a lecture and activities, it'll be sort of a similar breakdown to this, but we'll be getting more in depth and using even more tools to refine and align your daily routine so that you truly can start to experience the benefits of work-life balance. And please just remember that radical self-care is the key to making this world a better place. You make yourself better, you have more capacity to support others and to contribute and to show up for your work in this world. So thank you so much for showing up with me right now, for committing your time, for sitting with me, for being present, for thinking critically about your experience and for caring for yourself. See you soon.